Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Today's episode of the Social Work Podcast is a critique of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5th edition, which everybody calls the DSM-5. The two years leading up to the publication of the DSM-5 in May 2013 have been described as, quote, a war that has shaken psychiatry to its core. The chair of the DSM-4 task force, Alan Francis, publicly denounced the process used by the DSM-5 task force and cautioned that the changes in DSM-5 would, quote, turn our current diagnostic inflation into hyperinflation by converting millions of normal people into mental patients, end quote. The value of the DSM-5 as a Bible for mental health practitioners was further questioned in 2013 when Thomas Insel, then the director of the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, he published a blog post in which he said, quote, mental health research cannot succeed if we use DSM categories as the gold standard. That's why NIMH will be reorienting its research away from DSM categories. By the time the DSM-5 was published in May 2013, it seemed quite possible that the addition of 15 new diagnoses, removal of the multi-axial system, and the reorganization of the text itself would lead to a disaster of epic proportions. So, have the dire predictions come true, or were these predictions, to quote Shakespeare, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing? Well, I'm recording this in January 2016, and it's still a little early to tell. The DSM-5 didn't go into effect for most social workers until 2015. What we do know is that the critiques of DSM-5 haven't let up. The most basic critique of the DSM-5 is the same critique that's been levied against psychiatry for decades, that it does nothing more than medicalize or pathologize normal behavior. Let's play a game. I'll describe something, and you tell me if it's normal or not normal. Because that's basically what a DSM diagnosis is supposed to represent. Okay, here we go. Normal or not normal? Having a conversation with God. Normal or not normal? The desire to escape slavery. Normal or not normal? Falling in love. Normal or not normal? Debilitating sadness over the death of a loved one. Normal or not normal? Forgetfulness in old age. And finally, normal or not normal? Believing that you are invincible. If you answered normal to all of those, then you'd be right. But if you answered not normal to all of those, then you'd also be right. And if you answered normal to some and not others, then you'd still be right. So, how can this be? Well, in a nutshell, normal is a social construction. One of the vocal critics of the moral and scientific foundations of psychiatry, Thomas Saz, who was himself a psychiatrist, wrote about the social construction of schizophrenia in this way. Quote, If you talk to God, you're praying. If God talks to you, you have schizophrenia. If the dead talk to you, you're a spiritualist. And if you talk to the dead, you're a schizophrenic. Well, that was in 1973. And today, if I hear someone talking out loud, but I can't see who they're talking to, I'm much more likely to assume there's a Bluetooth headset in their ear, as I am to assume schizophrenia. So what about that question of escaping slavery? Again, it's an issue of social construction. In 1850, Samuel Cartwright, a doctor and slave owner, invented a diagnosis called drapetomania, which basically said that enslaved Africans who tried to escape were suffering from a mental disease. See, it wasn't the conditions of slavery that would make someone want to run away. It was a diseased mind. <laughs> 
And if you accepted this premise, then the corollary would have to hold true that not trying to escape was proof of good mental health. Fast forward 120 years, and we find that falling in love with someone of the same sex is a psychiatric illness. And then in 1973, the DSM committee voted to eliminate, quote, homosexuality from the DSM. That's right. Committee vote and survey says homosexuality is no longer a psychiatric illness. Millions of people not crazy. Now, the best report about this historic decision is an episode of This American Life called 81 Words. Look it up. It's amazing. Fast forward another 40 years to 2013, and Alan Francis, psychiatrist and the chair of the DSM-4 committee that I mentioned earlier, is warning people that DSM-5 will medicalize normal behavior. Is this starting to sound familiar? He even wrote about it in a 2014 editorial in Research on Social Work Practice. Why is a psychiatrist writing to social workers? Stay tuned. Quote, DSM-5 exacerbates the medicalization of normal behavior by relabeling as mental disorder the sadness of grief, the temper tantrums of children, the normal forgetfulness of old age, the everyday distractibility of adult life, the worries of the medically ill, and the temptations of binge eating. Now, if you're still in the mood for games, you can try and name the diagnoses Dr. Francis is referring to. Is it ever okay to say that someone isn't normal? Are there ever situations where giving a diagnosis is good? Well, as it turns out, yes. And I'm not just talking about diagnosis as a means to finance treatment. Yes, third-party reimbursement hinges on diagnosis, but... I'm talking about something less institutional and more personal. There are people who like labels, who find comfort in being able to name or label what is wrong. The label draws a boundary around an experience. One of the most effective psychotherapies for the treatment of depression, interpersonal psychotherapy, which I talked about in episode 10, uses labeling as a key intervention. In IPT, the therapist gives people the sick role. It goes something like this. Imagine I'm the therapist and you're the client. You meet criteria for major depressive disorder, and I might say something like this. The reason why you've been having difficulty is because you have an illness called depression. It's a treatable illness, but like all illnesses, it makes it difficult to do some things. Now, in the case of IPT, the sick role draws a boundary around the experience of depression and says it's reasonable to do this and not reasonable to do that until your depressive symptoms decrease. But labels can even draw up boundaries around a group of people. When you put up boundaries, you separate. And when separation systematically oppresses people, we call that boundary segregation. But when labels group people together, it can create community. Psychologist Gary Greenberg has suggested that one of the best examples of the power of a diagnosis to build community is the diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, which was established in DSM-4 and then removed and subsumed under autistic spectrum disorder in DSM-5. According to Greenberg, quote, Asperger's syndrome gave people whose primary symptom was isolation, a way to belong and provided resources to those who were diagnosed, end quote. So I know what you're wondering, is DSM diagnosis good or bad? Well, today's episode won't be the definitive answer to that question but it will give you cause to pause when you're thinking about the role of DSM-5 in the professional life of social workers and the people we serve. And to help me unpack this issue, my guest is social work faculty member from Florida State University, Jeffrey LaCase. Dr. LaCase is an expert in psychiatric medications and has published several critiques of the changes in DSM-5. In today's episode, Dr. LaCase critiques the definition of mental illness 
the empirical support for and reliability of DSM-5 diagnoses, the politics associated with the creation and publishing of the DSM, and what it means for social workers to be the single largest group of professionals who diagnose people with psychiatric disorders based on the DSM. And since we're the largest group, it would make sense that a psychiatrist would be writing to social workers. Now, one quick note about the interview. I spoke with Jeff in January 2016 at the 20th Annual Society for Social Work and Research Conference in Washington, D.C. We did the interview in his hotel room, and at one point you can hear music and children in the background. It's not really distracting, but since we're talking about mental disorders, I thought it was only fair to let you know that you're not hearing things. And now, without further ado, on to episode 101 of the Social Work Podcast, Critiques of the DSM-5, interview with Jeffrey LaCase, PhD. Jeff, thanks so much for being here on the podcast and talking with us about DSM-5. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. So one of the things that the DSM-5 uh, was advertised as being was a significant improvement over the highly criticized DSM-4. But you don't really see it as an improvement, do you? I, I do not see it as an improvement, and I think that's what the data w would show. Um, I think one thing we have to remember, especially as social workers, is that the DSM-5 is a product of a, of a private guild who makes a profit by selling it. And it's actually a very interesting thing, if you think about it, that a private guild gets to decide uh, who is mentally ill and who is not in our society. And as social workers, from a social justice standpoint, that, that's just an awful, interesting, and very kind of American sort of thing for us to think about, given the relationships between drug companies and psychiatrists, and especially those who are influential on something uh, like the DSM-5. Uh, to be fair, I think there's plenty of academic psychiatrists out there that would say the DSM-5 is not an improvement. And NIMH voted with their feet. They said, we, we don't want to be involved with, with DSM-5. Um, but they said they wanted to do the RDOCs. Yeah, yeah they yeah. went under the RDOC criteria. And I mean, that's a really complicated separate issue. But um, obviously, the utility of DSM-5 is going to be in clinical practice. That's why social workers need to be familiar with it for reimbursement purchase purposes, et cetera. But as far as DSM-5 um, being an expression of you know, improved science, I do not think that is true, and I think that's remarkable, actually, if you think about it, because DSM-4 is 1994, DSM-4-TR is 2000, and then 15 years later, it would be reasonable to say, okay, so we have improved this system, right? We got a little better. Actually, some of the numbers for DSM-5 are worse than the test for DSM-3 in 1980. And what do, you, what do you mean by that? What, what numbers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to give you one example, the, the kappa value, the test-retest reliability for diagnoses is the, the primary variable used to measure accuracy, which is somewhat primitive, but it has some utility. So that means if a client goes to see two separate clinicians in around the same time period, you know, what percentage of the time do they agree uh, that the client has, let's say, depression? Mm -hmm. so, so if they went to see me and they went to see you. Exactly. And so if, uh, you know, there's 100% agreement, that's great. Now, that doesn't exist in medicine. I mean, there's always diagnostic ambiguity. Um, but I was stunned at the level of inaccuracy of DSM-5, and that's why I'm at this conference with you presenting a paper on this issue. It was 28% for major depression. It was 20% for generalized anxiety disorder. And the the interesting thing is that the American Psychiatric Association, their work group, they really tried to spin these results in scientific journals. And, you know, uh, as researchers, we're used to that. But I think your average consumer of research results just thinks, well, these are, you know, scientists. This is going to be objective research. It's anything but. They spun these as, if not an improvement, at least very positive results. They said, we got good results. DSM's pretty reliable. 20% and 28%. I mean, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Those are abysmal results. And those are two of the most, as you know, two of the most common disorders diagnosed. And let me be a little more specific. If 100 clients who had, the way the study worked, if, if there's 100 clients who had uh, previously been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder under DSM-4 TR, or very prominent symptoms of it, and you and I got trained specifically on, on how to share diagnostic patterns, and then we used instruments that are contained in the DSM-5, which are uh, often not used in the community. And if we did this study in a place that has a lot of people who have generalized anxiety disorder, the prevalence is quite high, and then the number at the end of the study is 
percent. Um, it leads to questions, you know, that, that's just reliability, by the way. That's not validity, which is a whole separate discussion. But DSM-5, the whole idea of the modern DSM system, the reason you have checklists is because that's supposed to make diagnosis at least reliable. And validity, we can't really get to. But reliable, we can get to reliability. You know, reliable status is, is supposed to be the point. 20 to 28 percent. Schizophrenia, I believe, was 46 percent. Alcohol use disorder was 40 percent. Um, and I have to say, it'd be unrealistic to expect numbers in the 90s or maybe even the 80s. Um, you know, autism, I think, was 69%, for example. And that's something that, because of the eye contact and how young it happens, it's probably easier to, to diagnose. ADHD was fairly high. But some of these very commonly uh, diagnosed mental disorders, um, in this bell jar of an experiment where they, they're trying very hard, had numbers of like 20%. Percent, um, and of course, the American Psychiatric Association defined what, what a good value was for this, and they said uh, unacceptable was twenty percent or lower, implying that anything above twenty percent was okay, or at least acceptable, if not good or excellent, etc. And it was interesting because uh, people not, may not be aware, but two of the primary critics of the DSM-5 were Bob Spitzer, the editor of DSM-3 3 and 3R, who wrote a letter in saying, "Certainly, you're going to get kappa values as good as we got in 1980." I mean, he really threw down on him. It was very interesting. And then Alan Francis comes out and says, you're trying to redefine accuracy so we look silly to the rest of medicine. Right. So, Alan Francis, head of the DSM-4. Yeah, DSM-4, 4TR, yeah. um, who has made a public apology for DSM-4 and 4TR, came out of retirement to fight against, you know, the rhetoric around DSM-5. Um, so I think it's an important issue when it comes to informed consent and some of the things that you could argue from an ethical standpoint. Um, there's a way to as far as what clinicians would get out of something like this. There's a way to talk to a client about diagnosis and there's pragmatic issues of reimbursement and all that sort of stuff. Um, but do clients know that I've been, I, you know, let's imagine someone just got out of a divorce or a bad relationship, or just had a divorce or a bad relationship and uh, or had some other kind of loss and they're diagnosed three months of chronic symptoms with depression. Um, that's a dilemma for clinicians. You have to make judgment calls. There's the bereavement stuff. In the DSM, there's a note to clinicians. But does the client who's being diagnosed know, look, if you saw someone else, you know, on average, 28% of the time, those two people will agree that you are indeed depressed. Now, the people could be, I mean, I think it's, it's really important to say, this doesn't mean we don't identify people who are distressed or disturbed or have lots of symptoms that are in these DSM checklists. But for social workers and social work academics like us, the dilemma that is an unpleasant dilemma to raise is we have pushed all in on this idea of evidence-based and evidence-informed practice. The treatment guides are organized around these, these clusters, around these diagnoses. And in a recent editorial, I said, hold on a second. Um, if the diagnosis isn't reliable, how do you even proceed beyond that? And I think it's frustrating to people because I don't have a good answer to that question at all. But that's a really important question, and it's very convenient to skip that question, I think. Um, but I don't think anyone has good answers to that question yet. That's such a great point because for years, and for as long as I've, you know, I went to school in the mid '90s for my MSW. I mean, for years, the the mantra has been that treatment follows assessment and diagnosis. And you're right. If I'm saying, oh, this is definitely major depressive disorder, and I'm not saying, you know, you could get a second opinion and they could totally disagree. Like there's, then the person is not providing informed consent to this. And furthermore, my treatment plan could very well be wrong because I diagnosed it doesn't necessarily mean I'm right. Well, luckily, a lot of what we do is nonspecific. And luckily, a lot of the common factor stuff would say maybe it doesn't matter uh, whether you have generalized anxiety disorder, quote unquote, or it's depression with anxious features that, you know, through the therapeutic relationship, all that stuff's going to work regardless of the diagnosis. I study psychiatric medications as my primary thing. Those are labeled by DSM category for what they're approved for. That's a little different. And I think, uh, and there's some nonspecific stuff about the way drugs work too, obviously. Um, but it's called an antidepressant because it's used for depression. And they're also used for anxiety disorders and they're pretty effective for, you know, just as effective for that as they are for depression, maybe more so um, to the degree that they are effective at all. I, I think as a field, and a recent editorial, I said we ought to start rethinking this a little bit because it actually opens up avenues of research and new ways of looking at things. 
Um, and also, we're not psychiatrists. I mean, we have a 100-year history of cooperating very closely with psychiatrists, but we're theoretically more holistic, more committed to social justice, the macro, the meso, the effects of things like oppression and things that are related to depression that we don't think of as biological. Uh, and I think when you diagnose using the manual written by psychiatrists, I understand it has to be done in practice. I don't have great answers for that either. But what I'd like to see is to see an agency, a state, an area experiment working without diagnosis. Um, I teach psychopathology. And uh, I'd actually be curious about your opinion about this issue. In all the textbooks, it says that diagnoses are essential for good clinical communication. So that clinicians can can communicate to each other. just as an example, so I could write down that John has major depression, you know, severe, of, of a severe nature. Um, I, I just don't understand. I'm not trying to be facetious here. I don't understand how that is more helpful than me telling you, hey, Jonathan, John just got divorced. He's chronically sad and suicidal. It's been going on for 12 weeks, and he is not doing well at all. He needs some help. That took an extra five seconds to say that. I don't understand. I literally don't understand. I get the the reimbursement issues. I get the medication issues. But in terms of clinical communication, if you and I work at an agency together, I think the latter description is much more descriptive. And I did it at eighth grade level of education, you know, but it sounds less medical. There's a lot of... So that's something I think we ought to think about. I mean, all the textbooks say this is essential for clinical communication, and I don't know that it is. Well, and what what happens is that when I'm saying, oh, yeah, so John, you know, major depressive disorder, um, historically it becomes more problematic when I'm like, oh, yeah, John, borderline personality disorder, right? I'm not talking about, yeah, so there's some some real issues with emotion regulation. He's got some issues around self-harm. He's got this. There's some trauma background. Like, all that stuff is really important clinical information. But I'm like, yeah, borderline. And then you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, I don't want to work with this guy. And I think that is a great example of how a diagnosis is terrible clinical communication. No, I would agree. And we, we, and we kind of talk out of both sides of our mouth a little bit out of necessity in that we teach students to do in-depth psychosocials, and that's where the good clinical communication. Uh, but the diagnosis is supposed to be like the summary statement. That borderline issue is very interesting, though, because that's a fairly sexist diagnosis. Um, and rather than saying so-and-so was sexually traumatized as a child, has these acting out behaviors, et cetera, we collapsed it into borderline. What's interesting is that there was a study done where they looked at how many different types of borderlines you could build using the checklist in the DSM-5, and you can create hundreds of clients, some of whom look nothing like each other, and we still call them all borderlines because that's the disorder, Uh, that's the name of the disorder. Uh, So that, even that idea that it communicates something, but you can build different looking depressives too. Mm -hmm. Certainly different by age. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think this is the other thing about DSM we might want to think about as far as the degree to which it's scientific is it was like a medical textbook, you know, and it looks very authoritative. And it's from the American Psychiatric Association, which is, you know, we have respect for that profession, so on and so forth. But what happened is a bunch of people got around a table and decided this is a mental disorder. And here are the, and there's books written about this. Paula Kaplan wrote a book about the, uh, I don't want to say the invention, but the creation of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD. She resigned from it in disgust because she was so offended by the, the process. Um, because it was so subjective. But when you get that book in the mail or you get the online book on Amazon or whatever and you look at it, you forget like a bunch of people just decided this. Now, they may have used research to do that, um, and it depends on which disorder we're talking about, how well validated it is, how reliable it is. But Paula makes the point that she wrote an entire book about how human and uh, troubling she found the process. So we, we for, speaking of DSM-5, we end up with new disorders like binge eating disorder, like minor neurocognitive disorder, um, which some people say is medicalizing being in your 50s and early 60s, you know. Um, and then there was just a drug approved by the, you know, the FDA for female hypoactive sexual dysfunction, um, which, you know, there's, a, there's easy, it's easy to critique that, dis- that disorder on the basis that, uh, that that's a medi- medicalizing what's a very relational issue. Um, so if these things could be reliably, if these capital values are really high for all these, these entities, it'd be a different debate. They're just really, really poor. And I don't, it's not like I don't understand why the American Psychiatric Association 
would say, no, this, th these are good values. This, this, was, this was a rigorous test because they're selling their book with science. And there are competitors. We could switch to ICD, uh, the International Classification of Diseases. It's on the web for free. Um, but I think people forget that they're buying, this is a product they market, and you have to wonder if there'll be a DSM-6. I mean, I, I'm sure you remember all the furor. I mean, on Huffington Post, there's, I meet way people in the supermarket who are familiar with the debates around DSM-5 and bereavement issues and, you know, ADHD being overdiagnosed, all this kind of stuff. So I don't know if there'll be a DSM-6. It's the most common question I get at the end of my psychopathology class. Do you think there'll be a DSM-6? I mean, I have no idea, but from a PR standpoint, it might be better not to have a DSM-6. It really might. Yeah, or, or um, I can imagine them doing uh, DSM-5.1, point point two. Like not saying we're going to uh, completely rehaul again. We're just going to do some updates. Yeah, um, and just to give a little, this is a little bit in reverse order, but, you know, DSM-5 took so long to come out because they were incredibly optimistic. I think it's the year 2000 or 2001 when the white paper on DSM-5 comes out. And they say, look, DSM-5 is gonna integrate neuroscience and categorical diagnosis. And it was interesting, because I was in my PhD program at that time, and I'm studying the limits of what we know about the brain, how complicated the brain is, what we know about you know, lesions underlying mental disorder. And I was puzzled at the time, because like, I, I couldn't imagine in 10 years that we would be able to you know, do that. Um, but they were incredibly optimistic, and none of that materialized. I mean, zero new science materialized that allowed them to map disorders onto the brain. Um, you do wonder at what point you say, look, this is, this is not an endeavor that's going to bear fruit to the clinician. The research studies are different. I mean, they provide data to be useful um, to other scientists, but as far as for the clinician... I mean, a lot of times my students are under the impression that at any time some of these disorders we could like, discover the cause. And what's interesting is that happened between DSM-4 and 5 with one specific disorder that's, that's pretty rare called Rett's disorder, which is a subtype, it was classified under autism, I believe. They found the, the genomic uh, problem that causes Rett's disorder. The etiology of these disorders is discussed in the chapters, right, for each disorder. They removed it from the book. They said, no, DSM-5 is a book of you know, behavioral disorders, mental disorders. That means we don't know the cause of them. Alzheimer's is always in there, and dementia are always in there as these weird ones kind of in between. Um, but my students are usually flabbergasted when I'll say, well, wait, wait a second, that got taken out of the book because we figured out what caused it, so now it's a known medical disease, not a confusing mental disorder that takes all kinds of clinical judgment to sort out. Um, so that's a fascinating example of, I think, what the DSM-5 actually is, you know. Well, that is amazing. I didn't know that. I didn't know that they took out RETS because they figured out what caused it. Yeah. That's bizarre. Well, it's interesting because I think the fascinating thing about being a clinician or a researcher regarding mental disorder is it's very mysterious. It's very confusing. It takes great clinical skills. And it's a detective story to some degree. I mean, you've worked with people. You know what I'm talking about. Often it gets presented to the public as this is very simple. We know what depression is. Depression is a, a chemical imbalance in your brain. Um, that gets, and that's just, by the way, it, the DSM does not say that. Um, but so the DSM should be a book of things that are poorly understood, difficult to assess for, and maybe will always have poor reliability due to how hard those studies are to do. And then people's clinical presentations change, and people's lives change, and the drugs they're taking change. So we could reach a place, I think, uh, where we say, well, this is going to be kind of a, I don't want to say a disaster, but it's always going to be a very troubling, from a scientific standpoint, sort of book. So what's the purpose of this book? It's financial. It's for reimbursement. It's for bureaucratic coding. Cool. Um, but you see it held up as a piece of shining science. Yeah, that's really difficult to support. And I think Alan Francis coming out of the woodwork, uh, who's as conventional a psychiatric guy as you'll find. I mean, uh, was involved with the TMAP project, which was a, a Texas medication algorithm project, which was a very well critiqued, uh, conventional kind of project. Um, you know, chair of psychiatry at Duke, I believe, or high up at Duke. Uh, for him to come out of retirement to, 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 to rail against this, I think was really an important sort of thing. So. Uh, rather than people thinking, wow, these social workers, surely, they, they, they sure critique the DSM a lot in the, those, those wacky, hippie social workers. It's more like, if you listen to the psychiatrists very closely, look at their own internal debates, they beat up on the DSM-5 pretty bad, too. But who's using it mostly? Well, we outnumber psychiatrists. It's got to be close to 10 to 1 in terms of mental health clinicians in the United States. But I, uh, if you go to the back of the DSM-5, 
and try to find not not who participated in the field trials, but the scientific advisors that created the disorders and all that sort of thing. Look for social workers. Um, there are a few, um, but there's not very many. So interesting that we do an awful lot of the work, and then as far as our representation, our voice in the actual creation of the manual, not not really there. And that's of course assuming that our voice would be different than their voice. I don't know that that's true. So the, those are some great critiques of uh, the reliability of the disorder, about the internal fighting in psychiatry, the the role of social workers in um, sort of perpetuating diagnosis as this thing we should do because we're the ones that are primarily doing I mean, if we just look in terms of numbers, we're doing it. Um, are, are there other critiques that social workers should be aware of? Well, yeah, there definitely are. And some of them are a little more conceptual in nature, but they're important. And they're pretty social worky, so to speak. I mean, one of them would be that the, the definition of mental disorder has changed yet again for DSM-5. Um, it's pretty inadequate uh, scientifically. First of all, it's interesting that over the years, the definition of something like a mental disorder has changed, but it just shows you how fuzzy this is and how hard it is to pin down. Alan Francis said in an article in Wired by the, uh, the journalist Gary Greenberg, who's written some good stuff on DSM-5, um, he says you can't define it. You just can't define it. So you're starting with something that the people that are engaged in this are just saying that you can't define it. Where is that boundary between normality and, and disorder? So that's a, uh, that's a problem. Um, the other thing would be this is a thought experiment. Couldn't you talk about mental disorder without assuming that these are medical problems? Um, you could talk about behavior. You could talk about, you know, social, a sociological or deviance kind of approach. There's a lot of different ways you can look at these problems. Um, but it's a sort of in the book, these are medical. Sometimes they use the word disease. Sometimes they use syndrome. Sometimes they use mental disorder. They use those terms sort of interchangeably. Those are actually very different things, and we're going to be technical about it. Um, I just use mental disorder to refer to something that's in the DSM, but even that concept, as I just said, it's a confusing concept. Now, DSM-4 had some uh, really interesting uh, limitations noted in the book. There was a whole section called, you know, the limitations of catechol diagnosis. That was removed for DSM-5. So that's something important for clinicians to know is, uh, it's just my opinion, but I think it's supportable. Um, the DSM-5 was like a much more political document than DSM-4 to me. Um, because I teach this class, because I'm, I mean, I might be the only person that sat down and read DSM-5 cover to cover to see what was new. That's a bizarre thing to do. I understand that. But I did that. And as I did that, I noticed some changes that I thought were uh, kind of, you know, disturbing. First of all, I deleted that section on the limitations of categorical, di categorical diagnoses. Um, DSM-4-TR had mentioned that the brain changes seen in schizophrenia uh, may be related to antipsychotic treatment with antipsychotic medication. Uh, that's gone. Now it just has a statement about, I believe it says that it just refers to the fact that there are brain changes and it kind of suggests that they're due to the schizophrenia. So now there's a debate in the literature about that, but DSM-4 said it might be the drugs. DSM-5 says, hey, their brains uh, shrink over time. Um, and this is a heavily medicated population. So I don't think I've probably nailed every single one of them. There's also stuff about it, you know, side effects of meds like akathisia, where it looks to me like more like a book written by people who diagnose and primarily medicate. And it's political and almost promotional in how they present things. And DSM-4 certainly had components of it like that. If you really knew this literature deeply and you read it, you'd say there's some politics here. There's some spin here and there. But I think DSM-5 is, is worse, objectively, on those issues. And see, that, that puts the lie of the idea that this is supposed to be a valuable resource for clinicians. Because my students are usually very upset about this, by the way. I show them on PowerPoint slides. Here's what DSM-4 said. Here's what DSM-5 said. Do you think it's a better book because they removed that information or removed that limitation? Um, and my students are usually like, wow, why did that, why was that taken out? Um, again, it's also possible that no one reads this thing beyond the billing codes and it doesn't matter. So I want to be, you know, realistic about it, but I do think that's, uh, that's an issue. So given all of these critiques, which I think are really important for social workers to keep in mind and, and, you know, what you said earlier about, uh, social workers doing psychosocial assessments, um, in DSM-4, those really mapped onto the Axis-4, right? The environmental stressors and those sorts of things. Um, social workers have to use the DSM-5 in certain situations. And, and since they do, and since Axis-4 is gone, how should social workers be using this responsibly? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a great question, Jonathan. So, so two two part answer to that. First of all, the removal of Access Four, uh, we should be more offended by that than I think we are. Barbara Probst wrote an excellent piece for Research on Social Work Practice in a, a issue I guest edited um, about the demise of uh, Access Four. So um, that was you know, often called the social workers Access, and as far as we can tell, it just kind of disappeared without them asking <laughs> an entire profession about that. So you're right. I mean, when I was worked, worked at a psychiatric hospital, I spent a lot of time. Writing things like homelessness on axis four. Um, and that might be a way that full five axis DSM-4 diagnosis um, might have provided some good clinical communication and that you get a good idea of the client's, you know, presenting problems pretty fast. You get a GAF score, that kind of stuff. So GAF's gone, axis four is gone. Um, we have Z codes now instead of the previous V codes. Um, and the Z codes list almost every conceivable like social work problem you could think of. So one suggestion, and I teach my students to do this, is to note the Z codes uh, to give a more complete picture of the client. Um, you know, if someone has a diagnosis of major depression, as we've been discussing, and that's the only thing on their chart, I think they become a depressive. I mean, I think they sort of we pathologize it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if there's a list of 10 Z codes showing just what they're facing in their life. Uh, that, I think, can paint a different picture. So I think that could be important. As far as what could be do at a macro level, it's a very simple suggestion. I don't know how you would implement it um, easily. It probably may be impossible. But if you could reimburse for Z codes, I'd like to see how many people would, uh, given the choice, uh, I can diagnose you with this disorder or I, or I can uh, just list these life problems you're having. Uh, which would you prefer? That's an interesting thought experiment, at least. And Paula Kaplan, in one of her edited books, I think it was a little rural mental health clinic, they stopped using a diagnosis sort of as an act of rebellion, and what they said is nothing happened. Um, as, far, as far as, you know, the impact of it, as far as they could tell, it didn't change their day-to-day -day practice very much. But those Z codes, I think students, I uh, hope they get taught in DSM classes. I certainly teach them. And, you know, those have some u utility. In actual practice, will people take the time to fill those out? I hope so. I don't know. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for talking about DSM-5 critiques, things that social workers should be thinking about this new document. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. I'm Jonathan Singer, and thanks for being with me today for another episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode or have suggestions for future episodes, please visit socialworkpodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit our online store at cafepress.com slash swpodcast. To all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you next time at the Social Work Podcast.